And so join with me as I lead us in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts not only be acceptable in your sight, but effectual. Help us to have ears to understand and a willingness to confess and repent of our unbelief. Please help us to seek your help to become more like Christ and not allow our sinful self obscure our devotion and worship. Father, we are prone to wander, prone to leave the God we love. We sing in one minute, but we can quickly forget. So we ask that you would help us in this hour to not only retain, but to just meditate in the days ahead. We ask for your help in Christ's name. Amen. Well, you're probably wondering, where's Micah? <laughs> well, several weeks ago, Micah had asked if I, I would um, cover for him and uh, uh, to preach today, and I wanted to return and address another important topic. You see, a few months ago during the summer series, if you were here, I preached on the topic of anger. One of the most common pitfalls of temptation and, and sin. And, and this was part of the summer series uh, entitled Biblical Solutions to Common Problems. Pastor Micah and Taylor and I addressed um, that the scriptures are sufficient. They are sufficient to address all of our problems that lead us to unbelief. And we address topics such as loneliness, lust, anxiety, contentment, and anger. And these common problems diminish our ability to worship Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so when Pastor Micah asked me to preach today, I, wanted, I said, yes, I'm willing. And the topic I had in mind is the topic of bitterness. Not exactly an exciting, raw, raw, oh, looking forward to this message, you know. <laughs> um, it's, it's one that's been heavy on my heart because it's one that's very, one that I have wrestled with and I trust and I believe many of you have wrestled or are wrestling with this topic of bitterness. It's because we live in a fallen world where the effects of sin and being sinned upon tempts us into this unbelief. Some of you may say, well, that doesn't apply to me. Huh? May I exhort you to still listen carefully. Because when you think you're above those temptations, take heed lest you fall. Because we do live in a sin-filled world. And we even sin against each other. And you find yourself tempted to anger into bitterness. May I say that bitterness is one of the most insidious sins because it redirects our attention away from God. You may be here. And it's hard to focus because you are embittered towards God, towards someone else, perhaps someone next to you, perhaps someone on the other side of the room because you've intentionally said, I'm going to sit on this side because I can't stand that person on the other side. Um, this morning, we're going to examine the root of bitterness in order to rightly identify this common obstacle and learn how to remove this sin that so easily entangles us into unbelief. And I will seek to first define what is bitterness and how this word is used in the, in the passage that we will focus on this morning. I'll provide the context and three pastoral concerns I have regarding this common obstacle to our devotion. And finally, I seek to provide a cure 
and a compassion, a way of escape from this temptation that can divide one's heart and the fellowship at large. Because I believe it is one that is very common to man, common to each of us, if not all of us. So let me first define, what is bitterness? Bitterness, and I have a quote up here by Lou Priolo, who writes a really, it's a small booklet, but it's powerful. It says, bitterness is unresolved, unforgiven anger and resentment. It is the result of anger changing from an experience to a belief. Bitterness is seething and constant. Bitter people carry the same burdens as angry people, but to a greater extent. You know, when I spoke on anger, anger is one that can rise up quickly. And for some, many of us guys, we can get easily angry and then it goes away. And, but bitterness has that, it just, it just smolders. It's a good word, right? Just, um, it, it's, it's fueled within. The biblical word for bitterness literally means a bitter taste in the food. To be bitter literally means it, it means it's just to cut through, to cut through or to prick. Um, it, and it's, it's, it's something that's so painful that um, it really comes from within. I mean, you, you may take, taste something and it's, it's bitter and yeah, you go, ugh, yuck. Um, but when we're talking about bitterness, biblically speaking, it is something that it, it dwells in your own heart. And I can't see your heart, and neither can anyone else here. But God knows. In other words, bitterness is the result of not, it's really a result of not forgiving others. It is also the result of dwelling too long on a hurt. If you are bitter at someone, it means that you haven't truly forgiven that person. It's hard to say that, you know? I've, I've forgiven that person. I said I forgive them. But you haven't because it still dwells within you when you see that person and all of a sudden that uh, it rises within you. I'm reminded of Jesus' words in Matthew 18, verses 22 to 35 of the unforgiving servant he was much forgiven, but he couldn't let go when he saw an offense of someone. And it is so with all of us. We have been, we've been singing about God's great love for us, his deep love, the way he has forgiven us. And we quickly forget when we see the person who's caused, as we believe, caused that source of bitterness, and we, we just can't forgive. Jesus says that both in Matthew 15, 19 and Mark 7, 20, that what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, murder, slander, pride, etc. All those really describe really fruits of what bitterness happens when it, it just it, the manifestation, those evil thoughts, even murder. Certainly slander is murdering someone's reputation. They, they come from within. So what are some evidences of bitterness in one's heart? And that uh, booklet by Lou Priolo kind of identifies a number of, of diagnosis. And I think of... Uh, I'll, I'll list some of these for you. Just seeking vengeance uh, ver by a verbal backbiting or a spiteful comment. Perhaps you're not as verbal. You'll just withdraw. You just won't. I won't talk to that person anymore. I don't want to even see them. I just won't, won't be around them. You give the cold shoulder. Perhaps it's another form. It's complaining. I can't stand, you know, this person I work with, and, and you can cite whatever. Um, you, when you start gossiping or slandering, basically you're speaking ill of that person. Whether it's accurately or inaccurately, it doesn't matter. The fact that you speak ill 
of someone. You have difficulty in resolving conflicts. You, you have distrust or suspicion of others. Your outbursts of anger, your biting sarcasm, your snide remarks, your mean-spirited joking, your scornful replies, your condescending communication, speaking to your offender as though they were inferior. Any of you can relate to any of this so far? Criticism, seeing faults of others. Again, suspicion, distrust, intolerance, impatience, rebellion against authority. You know what it leads to? Oftentimes it leads to depression. People come in, people pay a lot of money. It's an industry for depression. But if you f unveil some of that, it's the roots of bitterness that have grown so deep and long. And so I know bitterness is systemic. But what I'm trying to address is something that is systemic within the body of Christ. Because that's the context we're going to look at. So if you have your Bibles, open to Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to focus on verse 15, but I'm going to give a bit of a running start. Read verse 14 there. This passage comes to mind because it's pretty explicit. Verse 14 says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness with which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. You know, the context of this passage, the writer of this book has repeatedly pointed, he's, he's pointed these, the first 12 chapters here of the sufficiency and superiority of Christ since, since Christ is the author and perfecter of our faith. He's superior to Moses. He's superior to angels. Christ is our high priest. He's the living incarnate word. And, and it is Christ we are able to keep trusting by faith. And so the beginning of chapter 12 exhorts us to keep our eyes on Jesus as we run this race of faith with endurance. He says there in verse 1 and 2. And then he goes on in verses 3 to 11 that we're reminded that we should not grow weary in this run. Since the Lord allows difficulties. Do you know that? The Lord allows difficulties and difficult people and difficult situations to come your way intentionally. God has sovereignly orchestrated those things in your way as a means of God's discipline for our lives because we are his children. So in verses 12 through 14, he, the writer continues using that running illustration. The writer exhorts us to lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet. So those of you who are into running can all relate to some of this. I can't, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, and now, verse 14, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You know, that second half of the verse of holiness, I will not be focusing on this morning, but that's a sermon for another time because holiness is what God has called us to because without holiness, we will not see the Lord. But again, for another time. But I want to um, point that, I mean, I, that's verse 16, but... It, it, there's a stream of thought there that's consistent. And, but we're going to just fo focus here on that part in verse 15. Strive for peace with everyone. That means make every effort. Make every effort to be a peacemaker to everyone. And the context, remember, the context, when you say everyone, it doesn't mean just everyone in, in all of Upland and around. No, Everyone in the context of a church community. So this, within this assembly, strive for peace with everyone. 
The writer is saying that since you are the recipients of his grace by having peace and holiness, that means you are positionally in Christ. When you are in Christ, you already have that peace of God that surpasses all understanding. You are made whole in, holy before our righteous God. But your life should reflect this in community by being a peacemaker and one whose lives is set apart. It should certainly look that way in moral purity, but it should look that way in your interaction with one another. So not only personally that you should be considering, but you should be considering just others within this church. There, there's a corporate responsibility is what I'm saying. There's a cor corporate responsibility to one another that you strive, you make every effort for peace. So verse 15 says, see to it. Means to take care, to make sure, to look carefully, to examine, to guard against. And this uh, admonition comes with a weighted concern. He's addressing three major arenas. And as I said, I'm just going to focus on that second one, the one of bitterness. The writer says, see to it, this first arena is that no one fails. No one fails to obtain the grace of God. In other words, no one falls short or to be late, to be left out of God's grace upon them. In other words, you, you fail to obtain that prize because you disqualified yourself due to unbelief. It's not the idea, that, and follow with me, it's not the idea of losing your salvation, but really a case of not really attaining salvation at all. By, by way of illustration, think of, the people who escaped from the bondage of Egypt. And really, that's the context that the writer is writing to a, a, a Jewish audience. And they know that story of the Exodus. They, the people escaped from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. But they, what? They failed to enter the promised land due to what? Unbelief. They were eyewitnesses. Listen to this. They were eyewitnesses of God's power, the people of God were eyewitnesses of God's judgment, God's provision, his protection. And yet in the end, they failed to obtain the grace of God for salvation. Why? It's unbelief. Through complaining, through whining, through murmuring, not giving thanks to God, but falsely accusing and slandering towards God and his servant Moses. Let me venture to say that we're not much different. We're not much different that way. We are prone to murmur, slander, complain about leadership, complain about whatever. But within the, you, you fail to see God's grace in your life, God's mercy upon your life. God, what God has done to you, you fail because it, the test is the people right in front of you and you can't give thanks for the people in front of you in this room. You can't give thanks because you've allowed the bitterness to just eat you away. I think of Jesus' words in Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it, enter by it, are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. The, the idea is just missing out due to one's own fault. It's heavy on my heart that you can be here and you can miss out. All the blessings God has promises, all the things we sing about, all the things you've heard week after week, month after month, year after year. And your heart can be hardened because of bitterness. The writer of Hebrews writes similarly uh, in chapter 3, the same book. He says, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, 
unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I'm concerned that the deceitfulness of sin weighs so much that clouds you and your ability to worship the living God in Christ because you can't even see those around you to build them up, but you, you in your heart, tear them down. The writer is under is underli uh, underlining this problem of um, unbelief and he gives this second warning. He says that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled. You see, a root is something, you know what a root is. It's something that is undetected until it sprouts up, right? With weeds. I mean, that, all of us can relate to that. Uh, if you have a garden or anything, you just weeds spring out. It grows underground where no one can see it until it manifests itself, manifests itself in two ways. It says it causes trouble. And number two, it affects many and they become defiled. It means they become stained or unclean. That word picture is, is really interesting. It the, the writer is referring back to the Old Testament, back to Deuteronomy, written by Moses as he addresses his fellow countrymen. And I invite you to turn uh, back to your Bibles there to Deuteronomy 29, because I'm going to, I want us to read together this passage so you understand the context of this old root of bitterness. See, as I mentioned about the people of God, Deuteronomy chapter 29. I'll read selected portions just due to time. But the context is God has delivered the people from Egypt. And yet, follow along with me. Verse 2. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to, and to all his land. The great trials that your eyes saw, the signs, and those great wonders. But to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandals have not worn off your feet. You have not eaten bread, or you have not drunk wine or strong drink, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Going on to verse 16. You know how we lived in the land of Egypt and how we came through the midst of the nations through which you passed. And you have seen their detestable things, their idols of wood and stone, of silver and gold, which were among them. Beware lest there be any among you, a man or woman or clan or tribe, whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Beware lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. One who, when he hears the words of his sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall be safe. Though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart, this will lead to the sweeping away of moist and dry alike. The Lord will not be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will smoke against that man. And the curses written in this book will settle upon him and the Lord will bl blot out his name from under heaven. Move on to verse 27. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the land, bringing upon it all the curses written in, in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and fury and great wrath and cast them into another land as they are this way, uh, as they are this day. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belongs to us. And to our children forever, forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Listen, congregation. 
God has revealed his purposes and will to us. And when we don't heed his words, we fall short in obtaining the grace of God. In other words, if you are superficially identified with God's people and fall back into unbelief of worshiping false gods of this land, even today in America and here in Southern California, you are really arrogant and defiant in your unbelief. May it never be, but in a room this size, I believe there are many of, or some of you who are in that uh, position. And that's a scary position. And I'm concerned. And so I, for, as a pastor, I, I have three pastoral concerns I want to share with you. Just based on, the, on that one passage of verse 15. But this whole idea of bitterness. You see, number one, bitterness robs the grace of God in your life. And it chokes out the joy of salvation. It just chokes it out. Just like a root does to things that you're trying to grow in your garden. It says, fails to obtain the grace of God. What does that look like? Well, you fail to confess your bitter pain to God, first of all. You fail, you just, you just hold it. You know God knows, but you even fail to just confess that and say, Lord, I'm struggling. I need help. I need to cry out to you. But you just hold it within. One fails to pray for the person who caused the pain. So often the person may not be aware of the pain that they cause by their hurtful words or actions. You know, there are times where we do sin it. I have sinned against you by my words or by my act, actions. And, but may, I may not have known it unless you tell me. But I know there have been times that people have come up to me and said that I hurt them. But it was years ago. And I went, I, I wish I knew. I'm not omniscient. I don't know everything. I don't see everything. But do me a favor or do us a favor. When there is a sin, when there is an offense, go to that person as quickly as you can. But to allow the bitterness, which, again, it, it robs the grace of God in your life because who suffers? It's you who is struggling with the bitterness. You not only fail to pray for the person who caused the pain, but you fail to ask others to pray for you or seek counsel. You may be in that rut. You may find yourself really just, that joy is not there. I don't like my situation. I don't like the way dad and mom, or I don't like the way my spouse, a number of things are sources of bitterness. But do you go out and say, cry out to God. Cry out to others and say, pray for me. I am really struggling. I need help. I need counsel. I need to know how to get out of this bind. You see, bitterness nurses wounds, real or perceived. I was wronged. I was hurt. I was wounded. Oftentimes, the person doesn't even know. I was judged unfairly. I was fired from my job. I was let go. I was treated wrongfully. I could give you a host of things that can be sources of bitterness. But the, a bitter person is often focused on what has been done to them. And, and what it does, it, it breeds self-pity. Oftentimes the focus is on one's personal pain. Woe is me. I don't deserve this painful affliction. I don't deserve that. That was just wrong. In turn, when a Christian becomes bitter, their fellowship with the Lord is hindered and the blessings of joy and peace Sees. You see, it's the failure to give thanks in everything for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. You just, I, I, I have no time. I don't want to give thanks because I'm so angry with God, with others. And that bitterness is just a long simmering. The second concern I have 
is that bitterness corrupts your heart and perspective on life and living. Bitter, bitterness does not dwell on truth of the gospel, but upon one's pain. You see that? Do you understand that? You, you don't focus on really on worship, on, on what God has done for you. You're focused on that pain, that wrong, that whatever slight. The poisonous root is being fed and nourished within one's mind. And it festers unnoticed by others because the root begins to run deep upon one's heart, nurturing the belief that you deserve better by God and everyone else. I mean, there is this, uh, it's, it's, it's insidious. It's because it's, the tension is right here. I deserve better. God, that's just not right. I don't, I don't understand why you allowed this to happen. And there are some painful things that do happen in our lives. I don't want to dismiss that. But when you turn it inwards, you suffer as a follower of Christ. A bitter person hardens their heart to unbelief, trusting that God is not in control. That God does not hear your plea. Or that he cares about your plight. Because you think, where is God? In the midst of this, I begged for God and he didn't answer my prayer according to what you wanted. And you turn, it turns inward. And it just corrupts your heart. You know, this belief system becomes cyclical since the embittered person dwells on what has been done to them unjustly and they suffered as a result of being sinned against. It's a form of idolatry. And you go, what? Yeah, it's a form of idolatry because when you, the one nurturing bitterness has elevated their beliefs to be true and their self-perception is clouded with an overestimation of oneself. For example, we live in a world where personal happiness, what I think I need to be happy, supersedes personal holiness, what God thinks I need for my life. We're so more, more concerned about my, our own happiness than God's holiness. Let's be honest about that. We... we we love ourselves. It's all about me. Uh, but I appreciate what Ken Sandy, uh, who authored the book, The Peacemaker, or Peacemaking for Families. There's two separate books. Very practical. Highly recommend them. Um, but he says this, quote, An idol is anything apart from God that we de depend on to be happy, fulfilled, or secure. In biblical terms, it is something other than God that we set our heart on. Close quote. That, in many ways, summarizes, uh, I deserve to be happy and secure. But do you believe that God sometimes allows, or oftentimes allows, not your happiness, but your holiness? I have another quote from a similar line of thinking it's from um, the great reformer Martin Luther. He says, quote, To whatever we look for any good thing and for refuge in every need, that is what is meant by God. To have a God is nothing else than to trust and believe in him from the heart. To whatever you have your heart and entrust your being, that, I say, is really your God. We hold we love ourselves and our view of what we think is right so high that that is our God versus the God of the scriptures of what he declares. And so bitterness not only robs the grace of God in one's life, bitterness corrupts your heart and perspective. But third, bitterness causes others to be defiled and it corrodes fellowship. Bitter, bitterness becomes defiling because it spreads quickly. That root just spreads quickly because you slander others. Because you've been hurt, now you need to let other people know how bad that person or how, that situation. And, and again, 
the whole area of bitterness, I, we can go into the whole issue of bitterness with God, but I'm going to really narrow it to within community here, within our fellowship. It's easy to become embittered and you defile others. You defile yourself, you defile others by slandering, by speaking unkindly, untruthful of a person's character. You don't know their heart and yet you're willing to express what you believe their heart is, full of corruption. I can't believe they did this to me or said this or they embarrassed me or they shamed me or the list goes on. You know what I'm saying. We find ourselves easily angered that turns into bitterness that then, again, you quickly defile and, and it really breaks that fellowship. Having this root of bitterness, is, it's, it's a corruptive influence in the local church. And what's scary about this is that this person, listen carefully, this person stays around the church and spreads the wickedness and causing others to think and do likewise. Do you hear me? And causing, they're, they're, they're not content to just defile themselves, but they seek to bring others down by coaxing them to practice this form of unbelief as well. My heart is heavy on this matter because we do it so casually and it's prevalent. That is why gossip and slander is so insidious. Bitterness changes your language from praising God to cursing men. James tells us in James 3, verse 9 and 10, with our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be. But it does. That's why you have these exhortations. Because they do happen. Otherwise, the writers wouldn't, Put these warnings up. So what's the cure thing to this? Friends, I want to say, life is full of disappointments, missed expectations, hurt feelings due to the sin of others and being sinned upon. I get it. It happens all the time, all too frequently. Yet bitterness does not have to be a life-dominating sin in your life. Why? Because as children of the King, children born again to a living hope, we belong to the family of God waiting for the arrival of King Jesus. Do we not? Do I get an amen on that? Amen. Uh, I need some interaction here. Uh, you know, we, because... We are anticipating that he is going to come and reign to make all things new, whereby we will not have reason to be bitter because God in Christ will return and cause every knee to bow and every tongue to confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. We get excited about that. But when it comes down to practice, we, you know, Mike has been going over here in Luke and we are anticipating the kingdom to come. But on a day to day, bitterness can still be going on. The Apostle Paul writing to the, to the saints in Ephesus, you know, it's not just limited to in Hebrews or in James as I read earlier, but in Ephesus, Paul writes in Ephesians 4, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This is found in verse 31 here. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. You see, the follower of Christ is able to to gain victory, to forgive another person because they have been forgiven much. They know, understand that they have received the forgiveness of God because they don't deserve it. But God has been rich in mercy. You see, forgiveness 
is an act of faith. It's not resting on your feelings. When you forgive, you are transferring your perceived right to justice to God's hand. You're saying, okay, I'm entrusting you, God. I may not feel it that way, but by faith, I, I, I'm going to trust you. A critical cure in removing bitterness is to really, again, what I read earlier, or what we read earlier in Hebrews 12. We didn't read it, I just made reference to it, but Hebrews 12, uh, the first three verses, we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin that so that clings to us so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to whom? Looking to Jesus. Why? Because he's the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seat, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such as such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. You know, when we consider Jesus, when we occupy our hearts and minds upon God's love to us, found in Christ, it redirects our minds from ourselves. That's why we come together each week. We need to forget about ourselves. We need to look to Christ to re recall God's great love for us. We need those reminders. That's why it's so important to gather, to assemble together. It's not just a religious duty. It's a duty bound based on we need him. We need his help. So when we, again, um, when we consider Christ, it takes us, it, it just removes that bitterness ever so slowly. Bitterness doesn't go away just quickly. I wish it does. It did. It doesn't. It's, a, it's one that you continue to, again, in removing a root, root it, it does take time to go in deep, to recall, to write down to things. Where, where are those roots of bitterness in your life? To think about and, and just journal. Perhaps there are arenas. It's not just one area oftentimes. It's many arenas. You just, if you took the time to inventory, it might be kind of sobering. Uh, how, where those roots of bitterness lie. I'm reminded of Peter's words. And I ha I've had to exercise this because there's been wounds that are deep and I have to remind myself of both 1 Peter 2 and 1 Peter 4. But let me re read a portion of that. And Peter just reminds the, that the believers, we do suffer um, because we live in a sinful world. And he says, for to this you've been called, 1 Peter 2, verse 21. For to this you've been called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example. Why? So that you may follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. To entrust yourself as saying, I, I'm, Lord... I can't deal with this. I'm going to trust you to help me through this pain, through this arena. Or 1 Peter 4, 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. You know, trusting God during these times of being tempted to bitterness redirects again our gaze off our circumstances and enables us to cast our cares upon Christ who cares for us. Congregation, I'm calling you, and I'm calling, I said to some of the elders, I'm, I'm fearful of this message because, again, let not many of you become teachers unless you incur a stricter judgment. I go, I, I struggle with this, but I know it's necessary. But I say for you, congregation, you need to repent. You need to turn away from what you're doing because it's destructive to your own soul. And it's destructive to this body. I think of 
the, the word bitterness, I just think of Simon the magician in Acts 8. You know, here he see, it's, uh, Luke records there in Acts 8 that Simon certainly appeared to be a Christian. He believed, he was baptized. But the fruit of that was he, when he saw that great things happening, he sought to offer money to buy the Holy Spirit in order to have personal gain. And Peter confronts him. And, and he says, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are then the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Some of you are in that same position that you say you've done these things Go to church. I was baptized. And your, your life and conduct reflects otherwise. And you think you can do something and, and play the game of being a Christian by giving your tithes or, or doing other things that look religious. But in your own heart of hearts, there is a root of bitterness that you have not dealt with. Again, I bring these examples because life is filled with temptations to be bitter towards others, towards God. If we had time, I'd love to review the life of Naomi um, in the book of Ruth. Naomi, which means pleasant. You know, she, she lost a husband. She lost, loses two sons. And, you know, she just says, I, I'm just, just call me Mara. Call me bitter. Because God has dealt with me bitterly. And yet, praise God for Ruth coming alongside to bear her up and to see that she becomes, to Ruth, a blessing because she becomes the mother of Obed who becomes the father of Jesse who's the father of King David. And you know the lineage of that from Ruth. But... You know, life is, is difficult. I don't want to minimize that reality. It is painful. We don't understand why God allows suffering and painful circumstances to come our way. But I exhort you, repent. Turn to God while he may be found. Cry out to him. I think of, you know, Naomi is... A, the whole book of Ruth is a good example, but I think of an, uh, an awful example is Absalom. In 2 Samuel 13, it's just like, you don't want to, you know, his sister was wronged and, and he, he allowed that bitterness. And so he plans, I'm going to take revenge and I'm going to take, take the life of Amnon, his half-brother, because he treat, mistreated my sister, Tamar. You know, that's what bitterness can do. It just eats you away that you can plan things of evil. And yet you, you know, you say you're part of the family of God. And I just bring this because let, let your heart not be deceived that you think you're above this. I think of how Joseph, another example, that's a good character study. of Joseph, Joseph could have easily been bitter towards God and towards the circumstances. But God allowed those trials for his good. Because even if you meant it for evil, brothers, God meant it for good. Do we believe our sovereign God in this way? That God has, whatever you are going through, I don't know your lives and what you're going through. But can you see the hand of God in that, okay, I was dealt wrongly. But I can trust God because even when people mean it for evil, God meant it for good, for my good. I don't know, understand why, but it was meant for my good. Let me close with an illustration. A couple weeks ago, I read this book, a biography of, of a, uh, a World War II pilot um, who comes to faith. He happened to be the leader of the... Um, attack on Pearl Harbor. And uh, um, it's a, an, it was an astounding testimony of how he heard the gospel after 
the war ended from an, an American pilot <clears throat> who was in prison for 40 months, 36 months in solitary confinement by the Japanese. And someone had given him a Bible and he had come to faith while in prison. And he committed his life to Christ. And a after the war was over, um, he vowed to become a missionary to serve in Japan. And this man, Jacob DeShazer, was able to plant 23 churches, I believe, uh, in Japan. But he had a gospel tract about how he was bitter towards God, bitter towards the Japanese people, and how the gospel changed his life. Well, this Japanese pilot named Mitsuo Fuchida read this and said, how can this be? This enemy would turn to trust this living God. Who is this God? But this Commander Fuchida saw the testimony of a young gal serving among the Japanese soldiers who are now being, the war's over. And he sees this young gal serving and he, uh, there's something about this gal, um, her joy in the Lord. And he finds out that this gal's parents were killed by the Japanese soldiers. And she would turn around to love the very people who killed her parents because the love of God impressed upon her the power of the gospel to change a heart of bitterness to trust God even through difficult circumstances and through the set of events the, the gospel tract the testimony of this young gal this Japanese commander said there is something different I don't know this God I want to know this God Jesus Christ, and he committed his life to Christ and later became an evangelist. But I, I think of the power of the testimony, especially in our world today where right now, even as you see the news in Israel, I think of my, our brothers and sisters there, the temptation for evil, for the atrocities that have occurred, not only in Israel, but around the world. You see, life is dealt with unfairly, unkindly. Maybe it's dealt with you on a personal level. But can you trust God that you are in control? And I want to worship you because you forgave me when I was an enemy of yours. And I trust that you would look to the Lord and even cry out. And perhaps you want to talk about, if you are struggling with bitterness, I invite you to talk to one of the elders. Talk to us about, because we, we know that God provides a means of a way of escape so it wouldn't enslave you. May God help us. In the days ahead, I'm going to have Mike lead us in a song, but let me lead us in prayer here. Father, not easy words by any means. For we are ones who are prone to wander and prone to leave the God we love. We say we love God, but quickly when something happens our way that we don't like, we can quickly become not only angry, but we can harbor those those ill feelings towards others very deeply. Oh, Lord, we ask that you would reveal those things to us, to have those rooted out, to forgive, for you have forgiven us greatly. And so thank you that we're not left alone. You are a friend that's closer than a brother, and we thank you for your spirit that resides and intercedes for us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.